Okay, everybody. Um, this is Denise Gabusta. Um, delighted to welcome you to this um, second in a series of seminars focusing on high resolution astronomy, the sharpest view of the radio universe, VLBI, connecting astronomers worldwide, which is what we hope to do. I know there are still some people joining, but hopefully everybody will be here by the time we're ready to start. We have another five seminars coming up after this one, um, up to the period when we hope to hold the next EVN uh, symposium in Cork in July 2021, COVID permitting. Let me first just mention some logistics of the webinar. You will be muted throughout the presentation, but you are invited to type in any questions you may have for our speaker through the question and answer facility. You can send in questions both during and after the presentation, but questions will be answered only after the presentation is finished. Please try to write your questions clearly and keep them short. We'll aim to get as many of your questions as we can, and we apologize in advance if your question is not among those we have time to answer today. I'd now like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Yuri Kovalyov. Yuri is the head of the Extragalactic Radio Astronomy Laboratory of the Astro Space Center Lebedev Physical Institute in Moscow, and also the Radio Astron Project Scientist. And for those who may not be quite so familiar with very long baseline interferometry, Radio Astron was a project to carry out VLBI with a space radio telescope in a very elongated orbit, which was operational from 2011 to 2019. Yuri is also head of the high of the Relativistic Astrophysics Laboratory at the Moscow Institute for Physics and Technology. On a personal note, I met Yuri when he was an undergraduate student at Moscow State University and first got to know him when he was working on his master's degree under my supervision. He carried out his PhD at the Astro Space Center under the supervision of Nikolai Semyonovich Kardashov obtaining his PhD in 2000. Yuri subsequently carried out postdoctoral work at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Charlottesville and the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn. He's been a senior researcher at the ASC since 2006. Today, he's going to tell us about VLBI as a key to the origin of high energy machines. Uh, thank you very much, Denise. So I understand that I can start. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you uh, to uh, be here uh, today with us. And um, we all know that uh, VLBI, Very Long Baseline Interferometry, is the coolest technique in the world, right? Because it allows us to uh, see the tiniest uh, bits of space objects. And as we all know, recently uh, it was VLBI who has helped astronomers for the first time to see the black hole shadow. Today, I'm going to add more to this uh, understanding how cool VLBI is. And today I will argue that it is VLBI, the very long baseline interferometry as a technique, which will also help astronomers to understand the origin of high energy neutrinos. So a few words about uh, astrophysical neutrino. So these are leptons uh, and they only undergo weak and gravitational interactions because of that they are so interesting uh, and important for astrophysicists because a neutrino can travel uh, truly very long distances being uh, almost not affected by anything around them. And by studying them uh, on Earth, we can study uh, space objects uh, truly very well because neutrino can leave uh, from the very central parts of space objects, uh, even in a situation when nothing else can, uh, can go out uh, from, from the very inner parts of them. Okay, so neutrinos can be generated by nuclear reactions on sun. Uh, we have detected them on the ground. There was a Nobel Prize uh, given to our colleagues uh, thanks to that. Uh, astronomers have seen them from supernova. Uh, and so the energies there are up to about 100 MeV. They uh, were uh, generated uh, during the Big Bang. And uh, there are some other astrophysical objects 
which sort of we don't know what what they are, which can generate uh, neutrino up to uh, PEV energies. And that is what we are going to discuss today. What are these astrophysical objects? Um, in order to generate neutrinos of these very high energies, there are two options how you can do it. In order to generate such neutrino, you either need uh, two relativistic protons or you need a relativistic proton and a gamma ray photon. And from their interaction, so you can see here on the slide, I guess you can also see my, my pointer, uh, you can generate neutrino. And what is also important for us today is uh, you also generate gamma ray photons as a result of this process. Okay. Um, so the high energy neutrinos, which we discussed today, um, they dominated energies at about or greater than 200 tera electron volt. And um, through recent years or tens of years, there are various uh, Adrian based production models suggested by many theoreticians. So there are many ideas uh, suggested, mechanisms suggested, which uh, tell you that in principle, uh, conditions uh, in centers or in active galactic nuclei uh, allow neutrinos, high energy neutrinos to be generated there. So allow high energy protons to be generated there, accelerated there, and then high energy neutrinos to be, uh, uh, to be born. Many years of research, however, and many years of analysis have found only one uh, high, highly probable blazer associated, so associated with high probability with high energy neutrinos. This uh, is the blazer 0506 plus 05. We all know about this result. These were two uh, wonderful papers published by IceCube collaboration in 2018. Mm, so Ice Cube has uh, detected a number of high energy neutrinos. We will discuss this uh, in details later today. And uh, one of these events, originally one of these events, um, turned out to be coincident with the gamma ray flare, which was observed by Fermi from, uh, from this blazer. Later, after realizing this coincidence, our colleagues, uh, the Ice Cube collaboration, uh, has analyzed historical data from, from the Ice Cube telescope, and altogether they have found around 10 uh, neutrino events. One of them, very high energy neutrino event, uh, which was in temporal uh, agreement with this gamma ray flare, and another, a little bit lower energy neutrinos, which were detected be, um, earlier uh, from, from 05 or 06, or from the direction, especially uh, coincident within the error, so Ice Cube errors with 05 or 06. Um, what I show on this slide on the left hand side is one of the recent VLBI images of 0506 made by uh, Eduardo Ross and collaborators published this year. And uh, on the right hand side, you see the light curve, the radio light curve observed from uh, 0506 by the Russian telescope Ratan 600. At, uh, here I show four um, different frequencies, 5, 8, 11 and 22. 21 gigahertz, and uh, a, a denser monitoring coming from the Owens Valley Radio Observatory at 15 gigahertz. And so the uh, vertical line uh, marks the moment when this high energy neutrino arrived to Earth. And uh, we can see that there is a radio flare uh, which has started around the time of the high energy neutrino arrival, probably at about the time, might be a little bit earlier than that, actually a little bit earlier, and it is going on, and it is either the strongest or one of the strongest radio flares observed from 05 or 06. So we see um, indeed a temporal agreement between the electromagnetic, uh, very powerful, a very strong uh, electromagnetic flare, uh, synchrotron and uh, and Compton as well, flare, inverse Compton flare from 05 or 06. At the same time, if you analyze the full set of um, 
gamma ray data, for example, from the uh, extremely rich data set collected by the uh, Space uh, Gamma Ray Observatory Fermi, and you analyze it against uh, high energy neutrino information uh, available collected by the uh, Ice Cube, uh, Neutrino Ice Cube Telescope, you do not get a significant, uh, a significant uh, correlation, uh, a significant connection between um, blazers, between active galactic nuclei and, uh, and uh, neutrino, high energy neutrino results. So I just show here a number of papers and there are many more published which uh, do not find any relation among the analyzed sample or they uh, do not find, certainly they do not find any significant relation between the gamma ray um, observations of epilactic nuclei, gamma ray data, and, uh, and uh, high energy neutrino uh, events. What's going on? It could be that O5, O6 is just a lucky coincidence because if you observe high energy neutrinos for 10 years and uh, Ice Cube is already working for 10 years, in principle, it could be that one time you will be very lucky and you will just see a chance coincidence between uh, between a given blazer and your high energy high energy neutrino event in case of 05 or 06 the reason why community or at least significant part of community uh, indeed has taken this result very seriously is because uh, there was not only one high energy neutrino coincident with, with gamma ray flare, but many more were found uh, uh, in, in historic data of, of, of ice cube, although the lower energy uh, neutrinos. But still, the question was, was open. Is it a lucky coincidence or uh, extragalactic nuclei as a class can be associated with high energy neutrinos? And if this is the case, this means that um, high energy neutrinos are produced uh, in actinic nuclei and this means that actinic nuclei uh, can be these uh, space super colliders which can accelerate protons very massive particles protons to very high energies now coming to what we have done i should say that um, the approach of using uh, gamma ray data in order to search for uh, exogalactic nuclei capable of producing neutrinos sounded perfectly valid, right? Because gamma ray photons, they are produced at the time when you produce high energy neutrinos. So this, this, this sounds absolutely right. Although it didn't, didn't, didn't work that well, right? This, this, this connection and this analysis. So a few years ago, we started to think, all right, why don't we try and use uh, our very rich uh, data coming from very long baseline uh, interferometry observations, surveys, and try to correlate the uh, VLBI results of um, observations of, of blazers of galactic nuclei with high energy neutrinos. This sounded a little bit crazy. I should say that we did not um, believe ourselves that this analysis, massive analysis, using large complete uh, sample um, of VLBI, um, of HN observations by VLBI, will, will turn out with something useful and interesting. So although this idea was um, discussed in our group several years ago, we didn't even bother to to perform the analysis. And one of the reasons was that Radio Astron was still up and running and was taking most of our time. So Radio Astron has finished its observations, as Denis has said today, uh, already about, uh, what is it, right? About two, one or two years ago, I have already forgotten. And we have found time for something else. And by having this time, we decided, all right, why don't we perform this analysis, which we have discussed, but didn't do anything years ago. And we have done it. So talking about VLBI, we have started with uh, a complete flux density limited sample, which resulted from many years of global VLBI, VLBA, EVN, uh, 
survey observations of very many AGM. And within this, so within this full sample, which consists right now of about, I think, 15,000 extragalactic nuclei, uh, a special effort was made in order to um, form a complete flux density limited sample down to about 150 millijanskis of total VLBI flux density. So the total VLBI flux density, I will I will use this uh, words VLBI flux density many times today. So by VLBI flux density, we mean the integrated over VLBI map flux density, which we observe from a given source. So down to 150 millijanskis at eight gigahertz, we have this flux density limited sample made. And even though we have data at many frequencies, for this analysis, we have chosen eight gigahertz because the completeness characteristics at this frequency uh, are, are the highest. So we believe that on the level of 90, 95%, um, the sample is complete. So the sample consists of about uh, 300, uh, sorry, 3,400 AGN. And you can find all the details at the link, which I have, uh, which I show right now on the screen. And this link has uh, all the information about the sample, the VLBI positions, uh, VLBI flux density, everything what you need. For high energy neutrino sample, we have done the following. We have taken all ice cube neutrino events with energies above uh, 200 tele tera electron volts and with um, uncertainty less than 10 square degrees. You know that if you take much larger uncertainty, there will be too many uh, just by chance coincidences and it, it will kill our, our statistics. So that is why we have chosen uh, this limit. And by doing that, uh, we, uh, uh, we got uh, 56 events. 56 high energy neutrino events from uh, from ice cube and there is one more thing which i have to tell um and before i do that please take a look at the sky map at the sky which you see here on the screen so the gray dots are uh, agn observed by vlbi so 3400 the blue areas, let's call them blue ellipses, which you see here on the screen, are uh, ellipses of uh, neutrino positions. So neutrino positions with their errors. If there is an AGN coincident with a neutrino, then it will be marked here on the screen as a star. And now important comment. Ice cube looks for neutrinos using ice. And the problem is that this Cherenkov radiation, which Ice cube is actually observing and is looking for, apparently its properties depend on the properties of the ice. And ice is non-uniform. And characteristics of ice depend on the direction from which your neutrino came into your telescope, into this uh, one kilometer cube of ice, one kilometer in size. So depending on the direction from which your neutrino arrived, properties of the ice are a little bit different. And because of that, in addition to uncertainty, which ice cube gives you, there is also an unknown systematic error. And while doing this um, analysis, we were also independently accounting for systematic errors of ice cube. And here are our results. It turned out that equigalactic nuclei, which turned out to be coincident with neutrino error region, are brighter than the average. So an average AGN, which do not coincide with these 56 neutrinos, are on average weaker than those which coincide. And the post-trial chance probability of this result is 0.2%. So to say in sigmas, this 
conclusion is made with significance with three sigma significance. On the way, estimating by doing this analysis, estimating the systematic error of ice cube, we got the value of half a degree, which is first of all meaningful. It agrees with um, independent and rough estimates of ice cube systematic error, which is done by the ice cube uh, collaboration by the ice cube group, and um, after we have presented these results within uh, in, in, in Germany and discussed them together with uh, the ice cube uh, team there uh, very surprisingly because we were very worried about this analysis we actually have heard very positive remarks from our colleagues saying that it could be that uh, our suggested way uh, to estimate systematic errors from this comparison with the LBI positions might be the best independent way to uh, to estimate systematic errors of ice cube Okay, on the right hand side, on this slide, you see the uh, plot of, uh, so on, on the horizontal side, you see the eight gigahertz will be I flux density from all the AGN, which um, are coincident, spatially coincident with these 56 uh, neutrino events. And uh, so you see that this black triangle marks the uh, average flux density for uh, neutrino associated AGN. And this blue vertical mark with horizontal bar, uh, so the error, uh, marks the average for non-neutrino associated AGN. So AGN which do not coincide with neutrino, within neutrino errors. Apparently, we are not talking about VLBI positional errors because they are absolutely tiny uh, comparing to anything or almost anything, including uh, neutrino errors. Important here is to look at the four brightest uh, AGN here, and we all know uh, them. And the, so the brightest one is the good old friend. Actually, they all are good old friends, but the brightest is 3C to 79. 3C to 79 again. And here, uh, let me show you um, the same objects on the sky. So these are the four uh, brightest um, AGN associated with the neutrino. And interestingly, O5, O6 is not among them. It is not uh, the brightest, apparently. Uh, and it is not even bright. Uh, so it is not bright enough on average. Uh, and moreover, it is important to underline that this three sigma result, this conclusion uh, that neutrino associated AGN are on average much brighter on VLBI scales, on parsec scales, than uh, the rest of uh, AGN is driven by these four targets. So we can say that uh, these four targets, the brightest AGN, are the, uh, have the highest probability to be associated with uh, neutrino. However, in this list of uh, coincident AGN, there should be more uh, which produce neutrino, including O5, O6. So this, this result also confirms, independently confirms uh, the uh, O5, O6. Now, um, okay, so we got the result about the spatial coincidence between uh, AGN selected by VLBI and high energy neutrinos uh, detected by, um, by S cube. The next question which we wanted to ask, the second part of our analysis is, okay, to ask a question, what happens with the flares? For O5, O6, we know that there was a gamma ray flare and which, which was um, later followed by, by a radio flare. So what about uh, our AGN? Um, can we perform a similar analysis, but again, for a class, for a large sample of AGN, instead of going uh, source by source and then worrying about um, just um, uh, chance coincidence. Uh, flares close to supermassive black holes were predicted by our theoretical colleagues to produce neutrinos. Uh, and so we decided, uh, so any variability on the time scale from month to year should be caused by parsing scale regions just because of uh, causality arguments. 
So instead of using VLBI and it's impossible, right? To get VLBI resources, to monitor a large sample of AGN for years. But thanks to this, um, causality arguments, uh, we can use a single dish monitoring data in order to check if parsec scale regions are related to uh, new, to are somehow close or related to, to regions which produce neutrinos. And we, for this analysis, we have used the uh, data from the Russian uh, telescope, Raton 600. It is a meridian, meridional type instrument, which has for years monitored a sample of about 1000 VLBI selected, I underline here, it is important, VLBI selected AGN, uh, three, four times per year at several frequencies. And out of the six, which I show on the screen, uh, we are not using two lowest frequencies because of RFI. The data are unfortunately quite uh, quite dirty there because of radio frequency interference. So we decided to use uh, four highest frequencies, 5, 8, 11, and 22 gigahertz monitoring data. And uh, the, the sample here is uh, has good completeness characteristics down to about 0 0.4 uh, Janskis. So what we decided to compare, we decided to compare the uh, average radio uh, flux density within half a year, so plus minus half a year uh, of neutrino event with the average flux density outside of this region. So earlier than half a year before neutrino event and later than half a year after neutrino event. And so we call this an activity index. Average flux density close to neutrino event divided by average flux density outside of the time of neutrino event. Neutrino detected from a source from a given direction on the sky. Uh, what do we expect to see from this analysis? Uh, due to um, synchrotron opacity, we see the radio core, the bright base, apparent bright base of a jet so at different frequencies, we see this core at different positions. And the higher the frequency, the lower the opacity, and the closer is uh, the core to the true base of the jet and to the central engine. So if you look at this particular slide here, so the highest frequency will be, you see, new five, new four, new three, new two, and the lowest frequency will be new one. So if neutrinos are produced somewhere close to the central engine, if radio flares are somehow related to this process, then the uh, closest correlation, the closest relation, the highest relation between the radio flares and neutrino events, we expect to see at higher radio frequencies. And here are, um, is an example of the radio flux density evolution for continuum radio spectra, which are measured by Rattan 600. So you see how every flare uh, evolves. Okay, let's, let's start from here. So you see green is the first epoch, then the second, third, fourth, fifth, and, and so on. And you see, so the flare starts always at highest frequency. So this is frequency in gigahertz, and then it evolves from highest frequencies to lowest frequencies. The same you can see on the right-hand side using the absolutely wonderful data from the uh, University of Michigan Radio Astronomy Observatory many years of monitoring. And here I use an example of 3C to 79. Again, so the green color shows to you 15 gigahertz, then eight and then five gigahertz. You see that a flare always starts first being green, right? At 15 and then eight and then five. Again, 15 and then eight and then five. So you, the, the, the flare starts always first at highest frequencies because of uh, synchrotron opacity. Okay, and here are our results. I remind you once again, we compare the average radio flux density within half a year from neutrino detection, and we divide it to the average flux density outside of this window. And this is the value of activity index, which you see for delay, which equals zero. And then we can also calculate this activity index, the ratio of these flux densities for the uh, moments of time before neutrino event, before arrival of neutrino, and after arrival of neutrino. And you can see here, exactly what we have expected. 
And what I, I, I describe to you right now is exactly the way how we were thinking along this analysis. So first we have predicted what should have happened. And then we have done the analysis. And then we have seen this, this, this plot just repeating what we have predicted if everything is right. So the highest, the highest uh, so let's say, relation between uh, this activity index and, uh, and uh, the moment when neutrino arrives, so this moment uh, is, is, is shown as zeros here, um, is for the highest frequency. So what you see here is an average curve for all the AGN coincident uh, with uh, neutrino, especially on the sky. Okay, and so this the red curve is for 22 gigahertz, uh, the green one is for 11, then orange is eight, and the blue is five gigahertz. You see that this peak is the strongest for 22 gigahertz, and here the probability of chance coincidence for 22 gigahertz is uh, estimated by us to be five percent. And we have also independently estimated the ice cube systematic error, which turned out to be uh, again about the same value. Here it's 0 0.7 degrees. Um, interestingly, I show here for you the average curves. And so here in this region, you see a comparison with what you get for all the AGN, which are not specially coincident with high energy neutrino events. And from, uh, sorry, from this comparison, we deduce this uh, chance coincidence probability of 5%. So I underline here that what, what I show here for you is an average for all AGN coincident, especially with neutrinos. What happens if um, I drop from here these four brightest AGN? The activity index will go even higher. So it is very important that this result is repeated. The relation between radio flares at high frequencies and the arrival times of high energy neutrinos, this result is observed even if we drop the four strongest AGN from the analysis. This means that for sure there are more than these four selected targets for brightest ones selected by the previous analysis as the highest probability neutrino um, emitting AGN. So actually the maximum, the highest correlation coefficient, the highest correlation between the radio flux density, between the radio variations coming from single dish from Rattan 600 and neutrino arrival moment is found by us for uh, another well, uh, well-known good friend is PKAs 1502 plus uh, 10, six, right? One, one, six, uh, one, zero, six. But again, 1502 is not the only AGN causing this effect, which we see here. So there should be many VLBI selected AGN which cause this effect. Okay, interpretation, how, 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 can we, uh, how can we explain it? So bright active galactic nuclei do produce neutrino. Uh, that is what we deduce from, uh, from our analysis of experimental data, ice cube and VLBI and single dish Rattan 600. And most probably they produce them by uh, P, uh, proton plus gamma photon process. Photons, most probably, this is still to be uh, to be checked. Uh, come from the accretion disk with energies which I show on the screen. Uh, this requires high energy protons with uh, proton energy on the level of 10 pet electron volts. The neutrino production is accompanied by gamma rays, but no significant correlation is found. And why is this the case? This this is truly a big problem, right? And we were very worried about that. So we believe that the reason why we do not see a strong correlation between uh, the AGN gamma ray level, gamma ray emission and high energy neutrinos is the following. We believe that the, uh, the reason is related to the fact that the secondary photons, so these secondary gamma ray photons, they lose energy due to uh, pair production very fast. 
So we cannot see the secondary photons which are directly related, which were produced uh, within the process of um, producing high energy neutrinos. Why will BI is the key? So by after after performing this analysis and after finding this highly probable association between AGN and high energy neutrinos, we have tried to find this relation also for non-VLBI samples. And we could not get this uh, highly probable uh, connection. So it is indeed the VLBI which selects exigalactic nuclei uh, emitting high energy neutrinos. And believe that the reason why it is the case is because VLBI is the best tool to select AGN with small viewing angle of their jets. And the reason why it is important is because relativistic electrons and then relativistic protons, they all are accelerated by the central engine of actigalactic nuclei along the direction of their jet. And then after that, when relativistic proton produces a high energy, um, mm, very high energy neutrino, since a proton is accelerated along the direction of the jet, a neutrino is also emitted along the direction of the jet. So neutrinos are also beamed. So basically VLBI helps us to select jets looking at us. And thanks to that, we see neutrinos which are emitted by, by this uh, actigalactic nuclei along the same direction. So at the same time, it is important to note that observed radio photons, gamma ray photons and high energy neutrinos, they are related, but they can be produced by related but different mechanisms. So that is our, uh, this is our interpretation and um, explanation of the results which we have, uh, which we have found. Let me move to the summary. And um, colleagues, if you are interested to read more in more details about um, our result, the paper was published recently, I think it was May this year by Astrophysical Journal. So you see the uh, reference on the slide. So VLBI is the key, I hope I managed to convince you, VLBI today, VLBI is the key to the uh, AGN high energy neutrino association. In order to do it properly, in order to get the highest, uh, the most accurate estimation of uh, the probability of this uh, coincidence and in order to get um, the most probable list of AGN, of neutrino associated AGN, one has to carefully estimate the uh, systematics uh, of, uh, of a neutrino telescope, in this particular case, ice cube. And we have estimated it to be about half a degree. Uh, we conclude the high energy neutrinos are produced not just by AGN, but in central parsecs of galactic nuclei, because this is what VLBI can see and detect. Um, radio to neutrino connection is partially caused by geometry. So it is, it is a very strong beaming effect. In, our, in my talk today and in our paper, we have um, selected five new galactic nuclei that are the most probable sources of ice cube detected high energy neutrinos. These are 3C to 79 and RAO 530, PKS 1741, OR103 and PKS 1502. So by blue, I show you the uh, brightest AGN from the first half of the analysis. By orange, I show to you PKS 1502, the source which has the highest uh, uh, correlation coefficient uh, from the temporal analysis, temporal coincidence analysis. However, since the time when we have published our paper, uh, another uh, highly probable association arrived. This is the source, again, very well known friend, 1308 plus 326. And let me spend a minute to tell you the story. After we have published our paper, we have sent it to archive in January. Um, 
we were talking with the uh, over group, Owens Valley group, and particularly um, Talbike Hovata, uh, and they have started an independent analysis um, comparing similarly comparing the high energy neutrinos with, with their data. And while discussing this analysis, along these discussions, um, it turned out that there is one more um, neutrino event, which was published by IceCube to have exactly uh, 200 TeV uh, energy. And we have missed it because we have formally put the energy cutoff greater than 200 TeV. And if we, add this one extra neutrino event to our analysis, it will um, be especially coincident, coincident with 1308. And actually, if you do that, and if you then recalculate the probability of chance coincidence, and it drops even lower. So uh, including 1308, the uh, overall um, significance of our result, uh, um, comparing VLBI and high energy neutrinos becomes uh, on the, becomes is on the level of about three and a half sigma. And as one can see clearly from the variability analysis, there should be more AGN producing neutrino in our sample, but which one of them is difficult to tell. Okay, what next? Ongoing and future studies. Um, we are looking, I mean, we are waiting for uh, new high energy neutrino detections. Ice cube continues working providing absolutely wonderful results, continues observing. And uh, we are right now eager to get more uh, neutrino events in order to independently check these uh, conclusions and advance our results. So to answer questions like where exactly these uh, relativistic protons and how exactly are accelerated and what is the process of uh, high energy neutrino uh, production. And um, we have started dedicated uh, VLBI and single, single dish programs uh, this year. And uh, we have applied with proposals last year and they have already started this year. All our proposals which were submitted on, uh, on, on this uh, topic on the base of these results were uh, supported with uh, uh, with high uh, grades. So right now they are being observed and we hope to get much more uh, data in order to uh, directly compare VLBI and single dish results observing large samples of actualactic nuclei with uh, high energy neutrinos coming from observations of uh, the ice cube telescope. And right now, as we speak, the uh, Baikal GVD uh, neutrino uh, telescope is being um, is starting its uh, full operations and we hope that Baikal will help us to get uh, to improve statistics because Baikal looks in different part of the sky so altogether hopefully they will allow us to uh, advance and to check our results within a reasonable period of time let's say several years I'm finished thank you very much thank you very much Yuri Okay, we've got a number of questions for you. Let me start out with um, a simple just clarification. Uh, there were 56 neutrino events that you included in your study, is that right? It, this is correct. And how many of those 56 were actually coincident with uh, AGN? Uh, so you can, you can see it on the, on the screen. So the ones which were coincident would have not only the uh, blue ellipse, but also a star close to that. And um, I would say that about 30 of them were coincident with, uh, with AGN. In, in our paper, you will see the exact number. For some reason, I think 36, but I might be wrong. Please, <laughs> please check in the paper. Uh, but this is a very good question because, Denise, it also allows me to add that we did not expect that 100 of uh, neutrino events uh, will be coincident with AGN because there is always a fraction of neutrinos detected by ice cube telescopes, which are atmospheric neutrinos. Neutrinos can be detected in the atmosphere and some of them are part of this list. So. There is no way AGN can explain or should explain 100% of AGN. Some of them come from the Earth atmosphere. 
Okay, thank you. And a related question. Um, are there cases where there is more than one AGN in the neutrino localization area? And if so, how do you determine which AGN is associated with the neutrino? There are such cases and you can see them on the screen, for example, right here. And we can not tell. We treat all of this AGN absolutely equally. And that is exactly why I am saying that uh, we have a list of AGN spatially coincident with, uh, with neutrinos. We have shown with uh, high significance that this sample of AGN spatially coincident with neutrinos on average has stronger AGN than the rest. But we have never claimed that 100% of them are neutrino emitters. They are certainly not. Okay, thank you. Um, just a, a, a small clarification again on the summary slide. We've had a couple of people suggest that perhaps OR103 and 1502 plus 106 could be the same source. Seriously? It could be that um, I have a typo, but what, what I basically wanted to say is that, so these four are highly probable neutrino uh, emitters because they are the brightest in the list, plus 1502, plus 1308, okay? Sorry for the typo. Okay, thank you. Okay, another question. Would it um, not be more meaningful to compare the intrinsic and or beamed radio luminosity of the neutrino and non-neutrino samples rather than the observed flux density. Is there a way to do that? Um, in principle, one can, one, one can do that, but you know, Denise, we, we try to do something as simple as possible, right? And, and you see that the whole analysis is uh, extremely simple. So as soon as you are talking about uh, luminosities, you are talking about uh, beamed and unbeamed luminosities, right? You have to know what is your uh, Doppler factor, right? And uh, we are working here with uh, thousands of AGN. And for most of them, we don't know what the Doppler factor is. And for the, for the ones which, for which we know the Doppler factor, we might uh, not know it well enough. So we wanted to do something as simple as possible, uh, which has as little additional assumptions as possible. Because uh, I think you would agree that it is very difficult to imagine that just by chance, someone has put AGN, which look brighter for VLBI, close to positions on the sky from which we observe neutrinos, high energy neutrinos. Okay. Um, now we've got a couple of questions on your, uh, let me see, activity index versus delay plot. Can you get that up? Okay. One is, um, what do you assume as delay equals zero for sources that are not associated with any neutrinos? Uh, let me let me try to remember that. Okay, for the uh, sources which are non-neutrino associated, we would just. Um, by performing the uh, Monte Carlo simulations, we would just uh, try different values of delay. And some of them will be equal to zero, some of them will be equal to other values. I think that is how it was done. I might be wrong here. It was done already half a year ago and might, I might not remember it too well. But I, th I think it is how it was done. Okay, and another, another question on that same plot. Why is the average of R not equal to one? Uh, yes, this is a good question. And this is related to normalization of, the, of this plot. And uh, due to uh, the specifics of normalization, it, can, it, it should be a little bit higher than one. Okay, um, another question. 
why are there so many more um, neutrino silent AGN in the sample? Are radio weak AGN much less likely to produce neutrinos? Um, I didn't understand this question, so could you please repeat it again? Yes. Why are there so many more neutrino silent AGN? I understand. Okay, so by neutrino silent, I guess uh, you mean uh, neutri uh, that why there are so little active galactic nuclei which produce neutrino. Yes. That, yeah, I, I guess that is what, what is meant. Uh, as far as we understand it, so it, it is related to the ratio at which neutrinos are produced in active galactic nuclei. And the uh, number of neutrinos which are produced by a neutrino producing AGN per year is much less than one. So basically, uh, when you are saying that an AGN is neutrino silent, you mean that a given AGN is not associated with any neutrino uh, detected by a neutrino telescope, but it requires longer time. So the neutrino telescopes have to integrate longer to get larger statistics. And as a result of that, the list of AGN, so we predict that the list of AGN which produce neutrino will, will grow. So please do not um, believe and um, believe that that AGN which are not selected by us by our analysis are neutrino silent. They just did not manage to produce uh, neutrino in the time frame when Ice Cube was observing, uh, so that Ice Cube did not detect them. And as far as I remember. Uh, the uh, neutrino telescopes, including Ice Cube, do not detect 100% of all the AGN. And to top, on top of that, do not forget that um, neutrino telescopes do not see the whole sky with the same efficiency. Um, okay, let, hopefully I am not wrong. Uh, so the um, highest efficiency of Ice Cube detecting high energy neutrinos lies between uh, about minus um, 15, minus 20 degrees declination and plus 30, plus 40 degrees declination. So if there is no neutrino coming from a given AGN, it does not mean that this AGN is uh, neutrino silent. It just means that uh, in, um, in, in ISC, a neutrino telescope did not detect in this given time frame a neutrino from this telescope. Okay, and while we're on the same slide, we have another question. Is the fact that the selected neutrino events shown seem to be clustered within plus or minus 15 degrees declination an effect of the ice structure versus incident direction? Um, yes, so I, I have partly answered this question. Let me repeat. So the ice cube is the most efficient uh, talking about high energy neutrinos between about minus 15 uh, and plus 30 degrees declination. Uh, there are a few neutrinos, high energy neutrinos, which you see uh, going up to plus 40, 45 degrees declination. And this is uh, the region from which uh, Ice Cube just detects high energy neutrinos. Uh, so it, it, it sits on the southern pole. Uh, so you, you, you don't get uh, much from, 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 the, from top of you, right? So it's, it's, basically, um, it's basically the direction within which uh, the uh, Earth acts as a very good filter. So everything else is filtered out and you only are left with neutrinos. At the same time, you do not see uh, high energy neutrinos from the very uh, high declinations, which means observing down being at, at the Southern Pole, because in this direction, um, Earth is already too thick and neutrinos, even, even neutrinos cannot go um, through, through Earth. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, do you know if any of your sources have been successfully described with synchrotron self-Compton models? I guess that the question here is uh, comparing synchrotron self-Compton model with synchrotron inverse Compton model, right? I guess the question is about that. We did not uh, perform this analysis and we did not uh, 
select AGN on the basis of these models. Uh, however, um, as far as I remember, right, from um, doing and reading the papers on, on this topic, uh, you know that there are different papers which can describe uh, gamma ray emission of blazers, sometimes using SSC model and sometimes using the inverse Compton model. So uh, to, to answer this question, uh, you know, strictly and carefully saying yes or no, I don't think that it is possible. Okay, um, another question. I would not expect that neutrinos come from the core region, but instead they come from the inner jet. The core might be optically too thick. Can you comment on this? Um, let, let me move to the summary slide here. Um, so let me first tell what we have found out and later comment on, 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 on this particular uh, thought. So we have found a temporal and spatial correlation between the central parts of active galactic nuclei uh, and high energy neutrinos. From the results which we have, which, which we got, we cannot tell directly uh, and with the high probability that this conclusion is correct. We cannot, di we cannot distinguish the region where neutrino is produced. Is it in the, um, is it in the close vicinity of, of the supermassive black hole of the central agent? Is it in the um, very base of the jet? Or is it coming from parts of the jet which we actually see at radio frequencies with VLBI? We cannot distinguish that. We can tell that it must come, and this is directly written in, in the summary of our paper, that it must come from the central several parsecs of an AGN. So that, that is our conclusion. But talking about uh, opacity, I mean, opacity is a problem for, for, for radio uh, observations, right? For radio waves. Talking about neutrinos, it is not a problem at all. And uh, as I have said in the interpretation part, so observed high energy neutrinos, radio photons and gamma ray photons might be produced by a different mechanisms. They are related, they are closely related, but this relation might be through, um, through some, some flare, some flaring activity we generated in the very central center. And then it started propagating from the very base of the jet along the jet. And while it propagates at some point high energy, so a relativistic proton was uh, accelerated, neutrino was produced, gamma ray photons were produced, radio photons were produced. Uh, it all should happen within the central several parsecs. But if it happens in the same region and by exactly the same mechanism, we do not know, and it might happen by related by different mechanisms. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, we might have... Okay, a follow up on that, Yura. If neutrinos correlate with the GEV, they come from the core. If they correlate with TEV, they come from the jet interaction. What do you think? Could you please repeat it again? So, if neutrinos correlate with the GEV emission, we can conclude they come from the core. If they correlate with the TEV, they come from the jet interaction. Is that true? If neutrinos correlate with uh, GEV, they come from one region, if they correlate with TV. I do not think that I can uh, answer this question um, properly. I think uh, that this, uh, this requires additional uh, analysis. And that is exactly what we will do, uh, collecting much more information from uh, from the future observations. From what we have done, I do not think that we can make this kind of conclusion. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and thank you from all the panelists and all the attenders for an excellent talk here. Thank you very much, Denise. Yeah, we'll be sending out information about our next talk as soon as we know exactly